I want to um, I want us to pray again before we open up the word this morning and get into what God has for us. So would you just bow your heads with me, please? Father, thank you again for your presence in your house this morning. Without your presence, Lord, we meet in vain. We're dependent upon you, King Jesus. We exalt you the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There is no other name above the name of Jesus. And we exalt you this morning, King Jesus. We thank you for hanging on a cross and spilling your blood that we can have freedom from our sin and we can have eternal life only through you, Jesus. We thank you for that. Lord, as we open your word this morning, we pray that you would just touch our hearts, that our hearts would be good soil, and that this seed would land on good soil and produce kingdom fruit, fruit that would last. We pray that your word would make sense to us, Lord, that it would be crystal clear, that it would not be confusing because we know that you're not the author of confusion. Lord, I'm asking that every word... Every word that comes out of my mouth be guided by your Holy Spirit and not by my flesh. Lord, I'm asking that today as your word goes forward that you would just continue to put a boldness, a supernatural boldness into the hearts and the bellies of your end time warriors that you're raising up. Lord, you see the wickedness of this day. And you've called your people to stand up and to speak truth and life. Truth of your word. And in your word and in through you there is life. Life more abundantly and life eternally. Lord, may we never be a people that keep our mouths closed. Now we know your word says there's a time to speak and a time to be silent. We get that, but I'm talking about may we never keep our mouths closed from speaking truth. And this morning, Lord, we come against every unclean, foul, demonic spirit who comes to steal, kill, and destroy comes to distract and we bind you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and we stomp on your head and we say you are not welcome here get out in Jesus name Father minister to your people this morning we pray in the mighty name of Jesus Amen and Amen if you have your Bibles I want you to open up to Daniel chapter 1, and when you find it, I just want you to put a, put a, a little, what, what do you call those things where you save your spot? A marker. Just put a marker there. We're going to be getting into Daniel this morning. Daniel is one of the four major prophets in the Old Testament, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. Daniel is one of my favorite books in the Old Testament, and our text this morning is going to come from Daniel chapter 1. And before we get to it this morning, I I want to share a couple of things. And here's my disclaimer. I'm going to share a little bit about my background this morning in ministry, but this is not about me this morning. I want you to understand what I'm saying, okay? Many of you know I've shared this many times. Uh, January 28th, 1987, as a 13-year-old teenager, sitting in a youth group in Jacksonville, Florida. For the first time in my life, I heard the voice of God. And he called me to an altar of repentance that night. And I accepted him as my Lord and Savior at 13 years old. Uh, At the age of 16, I began to realize that God had a call on my life, that he had called me to preach the gospel. 
And uh, I believed in my heart that that calling was to youth and to young people. And I spent, well, probably about 12 years in student ministry, my first ever ministry position came at the age of 22 years old. And listen, it was God because, uh, in case you don't know this, usually they don't hire single youth pastors to work with with youth. And um, not only was I had never served in a, in a ministry position before, but the church that I was hired by was a very well-established uh, church. And when the position came open the fax machine almost caught on fire from all the resumes that were flying in from youth pastors that were way more qualified than I was. But God opened a door for me to serve at that church uh, as youth pastor. I met my wife there at that church. And uh, working in youth ministry for 12 years... um, God has just blessed us, and we've seen a lot of fruit over the years of working with young people. This week, the Lord reminded me one of our intercessors here at the church, Miss Rochelle, who's sitting right over here. We have a lot of intercessors, but um, over the past several years, and I hope you don't mind me sharing this. I usually get permission ahead of time. But you know, Rochelle has come to me and said, I have had visions of seeing you stand in front of youth and preaching the gospel. And I've had visions of our church being filled with youth and people uh, being saved and set free and, and healed. And um, this past week, I began to reminisce a little bit about Um, my years of working in youth ministry, and I began to um, just really think about some of the words that Rochelle has spoke to me, and I feel like the Holy Spirit uh, spoke to me and said, I have not removed this mantle from you to reach young people. And the Lord also spoke to me and said that Second Chance Church, His church, and we know this, we've had, we've had prophetic words given over this body that this church will be a hospital to the spiritually sick. And the Lord reminded me that this church is called to minister to the youth, the generation of the young people in these last days. And it's very, very vital and important. Now listen to me. I'm not saying that we're only going to focus on the youth and everybody else can just be be out for themselves. That's not what I'm saying. But we have to put a great emphasis on our youth today because the, the, the attack from the pits of hell is greater than it's ever been against our young people. Our young people today are facing attacks that we did not face when we were younger. And this week the Lord brought this scripture to me in my Bible study and I want to highlight Daniel chapter 1 verses 1 through 7 and listen we're going to get a picture this is uh, the, the, the word of God is so amazing, isn't it? We're gonna get a we're gonna get a word picture of how the enemy tries to take the youth from the culture and that which God wants them to be in, and train them up in their own culture, the enemy's culture. You hear what I'm saying? So I want to read this first, and then we're gonna talk about it for a few minutes. Daniel chapter 1, starting at verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. 
These he carried. When he says he, he's talking about King Nebuchadnezzar. He says these he carried, the articles from the temple of God, he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put them in the treasure house of his God. I just want to stop there for a second. So King Nebuchadnezzar besieged Judah and he raided the temple of God and he took some of the articles of the temple of God and says, I'm going to take these articles from your God, from your temple, and I'm going to put them in my false God temple. Now, he didn't believe that it was false God, but it was. Now listen, this is what I want to focus on, starting in verse 3. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility. Now listen, young men without any physical defect, handsome, Showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. I read this, I said, Thank God I would have not been chosen. It's one that would have been one time in the history that it would have paid off to not been good looking and smart. Amen? Amen. Shouldn't have been that funny, but. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. Listen to what it says. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years and after they were to enter the king's service. Among them, among these, were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. And we're going to stop right there, and I want to talk about this for a few minutes. Many people that have not studied their Bible thought that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was their actual names, but that was not their actual names. That was not their God-given name assigned to them. That was a name assigned to them from the Babylonians, and we're going to talk about that more in just a few minutes. But it says right here that they took these young men, future leaders. And it says that they wanted to teach them and train them in the language and the literature of the Babylonians. Why did they want to train them? I'm going to give you a couple things right here. One, because they wanted them to become loyal to the Babylonians. They wanted to take their loyalty away from Israel and give it to Babylon. Let me remind you that the Israelites were God's people and they served Yahweh. It, Babylonians were known as evil people that served many, many false gods. Yet they wanted to teach them in literature, culture, train them in the ways of the Babylonians because they wanted to take their loyalty away from Israel and bring it to Babylon. They wanted to separate them from their former life. They wanted to immerse them in Babylonian culture. In other words, what they're saying is, I know that your people do it this way, but we're going to teach you to do it our way. This is important because the enemy is always trying to take young people and say, this is the way that God wants you to do it, but I want to train you in the way that the world does it. If all of this wasn't enough, that they took these young men captive and they began to brainwash them in Babylonian culture, if that wasn't enough, 
the Bible tells us that they changed their names. They gave them a different name. And I want you to see something this morning. Watch, watch what happens here, okay? So Daniel's name means God is my judge, okay? But the king says, I'm going to give you a new name, Daniel. You're not going to go by Daniel anymore. You're going to go by Belshazzar, which means Bel, guard his life, or Bel will protect so he goes from God is my judge to Baal will protect. There's meaning in a name. And depending on what commentary you read, one commentary says that this says, Lady, protect the king. But he goes from God is my judge to Baal, guard his life. In other words, his name means false God, watch over and protect him. Do you see how, this, how the changing of names? Hananiah, his name means God has favored. And his new name, Shadrach, stands for command of Aku. Aku was the Babylonian moon god. So he goes from God is favored to you are commanded by Aku. Do you see what's happening here? Do you see what, what the enemy is trying to do to these, these young men? By the way, many theologians say that Daniel was about 17 years old when he was taken captive by King Nebuchadnezzar. Some theologians think that he may have actually been a little bit younger than that. Nonetheless, he was a teenager. Mishael, his name stands for who is like God. His new Babylonian name, Meshach, stands for who is what Aku is. In other words, belonging to Aku. Who is like God to who is what Aku is. Azariah's name means Yahweh has helped. And Abednego stands for servant of Nabu, which was a god of wisdom. So they're immersing them in the Babylonian culture, teaching them the ways of the Babylonians, teaching them all about their culture, trying to take them out of what God created them to do and put them into a completely different culture. And assigning them new names. And these new names take away from their old names, which was to glorify their God with names tied to false gods. You see, what they were trying to do was they were trying to change their identity. They were trying to completely change their identity from who they were born to what they wanted them to be. What they were born to do and be to what they wanted them to do and be. This is important. Now we fast forward to 2023, and the enemy hasn't changed his tactic that much. See, the enemy, just in the same way that the Bible says that King Nebuchadnezzar besieged Judah and took these people captive, the enemy is still doing the same thing. He is besieging people and taking them captive. And when he takes them captive, he wants to train them in the world's language, in the world's literature. He wants to immerse them in worldly culture. 
He wants to brainwash them to when they hear something that says, thus saith the Lord, it doesn't mean anything to them because they've been so brainwashed in the worldly culture that that means more than this. The enemy wants to immerse them so much in our worldly culture, he wants to get them to accept the wickedness of the world. He wants to remove them from their called life, and he wants to give them a new worldly name, if you will. Now stick with me. So strongly, so strongly this week in prayer, the Lord laid this on my heart. And I believe the Lord wants the body of Christ to confront the demonic spirit associated with gender identity in our culture today. This past week, I googled, how many genders are there? Listen to the response. Male, female, transgender, gender neutral, non-binary, agender, pangender, gender queer, two-spirit, third gender, cisgender, gender non-conforming, And many more, dot, 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 dot. Now listen. Just this past week, someone who is well known in the worldly culture stepped out. He's a comedian by the name of Wayne Brady. How many of you ever heard of this guy before? And he stepped out and he said, I identify, this is important, these words, I identify, I identify as pansexual. If you look at the definition for pansexual, it means that someone is sexually, romantically, or emotionally attracted to someone regardless of their gender. Meaning, no matter what their gender is, they can be sexually romantically or emotionally attached to this person. Catch these words, I identify. I want to make myself very clear this morning. I'm not attacking flesh and blood this morning. I'm not attacking Wayne Brady. I'm not attacking anyone who identifies at a certain, as a certain gender because the Bible tells us that our battle, our war is not against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities. It's against spiritual wickedness. It's against rulers of darkness. And I'm telling you this morning, the body of Christ does not attack flesh, but we stand bold with the Holy Spirit and we attack head on demonic spirits. That's who are we at war with. We're not at war against flesh and blood. My battle is not against Wayne Brady. My battle is not against anyone who says, I identify as this. My battle, our battle as the church of God is the spirit behind it. So hear my heart this morning. Hear my heart this morning because my heart is not against people. My heart is against demonic spirits. As the body of Christ, we love people. We accept people. We draw people into God and we help them receive freedom from Jesus. But let me tell you what's happening in our culture today. And I'm seeing this in the body of Christ. Amen. 
even in the church I'm seeing this, that they are accepting this gender identity in the agenda of gender identity as normal. They're embracing it as normal. They're embracing helping their children to identify as something other than what God has identified them as. It's almost as if they're embracing the spirit that is behind gender identity and the spirit that is behind the sexual confusion of our young people. You can love your child no matter what they identify as. But you do not have to accept the spirit behind what is moving them in that direction. I'm seeing Christian parents that their children are moving towards the homosexual community and identifying as homosexual or lesbian. Now, now listen, it doesn't mean that if your child does that, you write them off. What parent's going to do that? We're not going to write them off. We're going to love them, but we're not going to embrace the spirit behind it. We're going to stand in the gap. We're going to pray. We're going to call it out. We're going to let them walk in freedom. But we see this all over social media in the church. Parents accepting the spirit. Churches and pastors accepting the Spirit. And, it, and it's, so, it, it, it's so wrapped up in this gender identity and this sexual identity because nobody wants to accept the Spirit of addiction. They'll put their kid in any kind of rehabilitation center, spend thousands and thousands of dollars because they don't want their kid to be an addict, but yet they will help them transgender or transition to another identity. Or they will help them because they identify as homosexual or lesbian. Hear what I'm saying? I'm saying this again. I'm going to keep saying it. I am not against the flesh and blood. We love the flesh and the blood. We accept them where they are, but as the church, we need to deliver them and help them get set free from the spirit that is behind it. It's almost as if the body of Christ in some places and even the parents of some of these people that are struggling with this have come down with what's called Stockholm Syndrome. Let me give you the definition of it. Feelings of trust or affection towards a victim's captor. They're captive by a spirit and they're developing affection and trust for it and then they're promoting it. And they're doing it because they want to love their kid, well, you can love your kid without accepting the spirit that is behind it. And we have pastors today in our churches that won't stand up and preach the truth. And, and, and why, 
why is it that we're afraid to talk about this gender identity? Why is it that we're afraid to talk about that or talk about, afraid to talk about the, um, how we identify sexually? But we, we, we're, we're afraid to talk about that, but we'll talk about everything else. I don't know if you're aware of this, but only in America, our Congress was having meetings on what is a woman. What is a woman? Did, did you know that scientists now are working on how they can, th- this, is, this is crazy, how they can take a placenta and insert it into a man to where a man can, ch- can carry a child in their belly. That is demonic. It's from the pits of hell. And let me tell you, as a man, there has never been a time in my life Not even a fraction where I've desired to carry a baby in my belly. I watched my wife carry three of them. And every time I watched her, I'd say privately, thank you, Jesus, that I am a man. Hallelujah. Can I get an amen from the fellows in the house? When my wife's walking around the house like this and soaking her feet in ice water and can't even hardly move and the baby's moving all around, I'm like, man, that is so cool. And I walk away, thank you, Jesus, that I'm a man, that I don't have to carry this baby inside my belly. The Spirit wants to confuse people. And if you preach against it, they will call you a bigot, they will call you a racist, they will call you everything under the sun to try to get you to conform to the culture, the literature of this world. We can preach against anything else, but don't preach against that. And the last time I checked, none of us are any better than someone that's suffering from that because all of us have been, been delivered and set free from some type of demonic spirit or stronghold in our life. So why is it any different? Why is it any different? God has set me free from, from lust. He has set me free from fear. He has set me free from rejection. I've dealt with many strongholds in my life. And King Jesus has delivered me and set me free. And the same, he can do the same for anyone else dealing with any other kind of spirit. But for some reason when it comes to this gender identity, we want to have affection towards the captor. I've yet to see a parent whose child is hooked on meth and cocaine and crack say, oh man, let me help you in this. Let me take you out and, and get you a good deal on some meth. Get you a good deal. I, I know a place where you can get it two for one. No, they stand up against the spirit of addiction and they bind it. Their mamas and daddies are up all night long praying, pacing the floor, saying, God, set my baby free. But for some reason when it comes to this, we want to embrace it. We want to go out and buy our sons dresses. We want, to, we want to dye their hair for them. We want to help them transition to another sex. It is demonic, and there is a spirit behind it. And that spirit wants to change the name and the identity of the person that God created them to be. Plain and simple. You can accept the person, and you can love the person, but you cannot accept the spirit. God wants to, can, and will set anyone free. 
that is struggling with gender identity and sexual identity. And I'm telling you, listen to me. This community will tell you otherwise, but I'm telling you statistically, and I, I'm telling you, most of them are depressed, confused, and angry in life. As would be anyone who's dealing with a stronghold in their life. And what the Spirit of the Lord laid on my heart this week was that he reminded me he has called Second Chance Church to be a spiritual hospital where people who are struggling with bondage and stronghold in their life, that they can come into this house, his house, not be judged, not be ridiculed, be loved and accepted, but they can find some people who is not going to find trust and affection with your captor. See, some pastors won't confront it because they don't want to upset the apple cart, they don't want to upset the parent, and they don't want the parent to leave uh, because they don't want the tithe dollars to leave. But, but here, we don't care about your tithe dollar. We care about the truth, and we care about freedom. If you know someone who is struggling with gender identity or if you know someone who is struggling with gender identity and their, their family is embracing it and help them, they need freedom. They need freedom. In the same way the alcoholic needs freedom, in the same way the porn addict needs freedom, in the same way that anybody else needs freedom, they need freedom. And God can and will deliver them and set them free. I had a friend of mine many years ago who was a minister. And he was ministering. I don't know if it was a convention or something like that, but he was, he was ministering to a person who was struggling with homosexuality, praying over them that they would receive freedom. And he tells the story that that night when he got home and he was laying in his bed, he had an encounter with a demonic spirit. He said he was laying in his bed and he said he smelled the most foul smell odor that he could smell. And he said, this demon came over top of him and whispered in his ear, they're not born this way. They're not born this way. God does not create homosexuals. The scripture says if a man lies with a man, it's an abomination. God is not going to create someone who he says the sin is an abomination. Not the person, the sin is, ab is an abomination. God didn't create man to be a cheater. He didn't create him to be a liar, a swindler, a gossiper, a thief. And I'm making a declaration this morning that as a body of Christ at Second Chance Church, we as a body of Christ 
who believe in the word of God and the power and the authority that we have in Christ Jesus, we are make, we, this body right here is a safe place, a spiritual hospital for anyone who is dealing with this type of attack where they can come in, be accepted and loved and be set free. And I've seen God do it many, many times. Where's that coming from? <laughs> that sounded horrible, by the way. <laughs> I showed you guys pictures of books that are being taught in our elementary school where kids can go to the library and it, it, it's, it's kid illustrated. I've shown you pictures of it before. This is Bobby. Bobby is neither a boy or a girl. Or this is, this is Bobby. He was born a boy, but he's no longer a boy. Or the genitalia signed at birth could be a clue of what your identity is. If you want to know what you are, get naked in front of a mirror and it will tell you what your gender is. There's no confusion in it. When I was growing up, this didn't exist. The 500 genders that the dictionary is, is spitting out now on Google, it didn't exist. I'm not saying that people didn't struggle with their identity, but I'm telling you, it didn't exist. And what our culture is teaching our people nowadays is, is whatever you feel like is what you are. Do you hear about this story? I, I mentioned this not, not long ago about a, a girl who identifies and feels like a cat. And at her school, they allow her to walk around oh, oh, oh. I'm not making fun of her. They allow her to go to a litter box to use the bathroom. I can stand up here and tell you that I'm a tomato plant. And you can water me and fertilize me until the cows come home and I'm never going to produce you a tomato. <laughs> Sooner or later, after you've watered me for a while and you've fertilized me for a while, you're finally, somebody's got to come to me and say, Steve, you are not a tomato plant. Son, you ain't never going to produce a tomato. I know you feel like one, but you're not a tomato plant. I know that you think that you're a tomato plant, but God has a different identity for you. I know you think that you can produce tomatoes, but God wants you saving souls. Somebody's got to tell them the truth. Someone's got to tell them that you don't live life by your feelings. You live by, by the word of God. My model tells me that you're saved by faith, not by feelings. There's a lot of days that I don't feel saved, but I know that I'm saved by faith and by what the Word of God says. So why are we tiptoeing around all of this stuff? Why don't we, with compassion and love, say, God has created you. 
You were fearfully and wonderfully made, created in your mother's womb. He's loved you with an everlasting love. He knew you before he created you. He knew who you are, and you have an enemy that hates you. You have an enemy that when he sees you, he sees the image of God. You have an enemy that wants to confuse you. You have an enemy that wants to kill, steal, and destroy. And there is a spirit behind what's going on in your mind and in your body. What's wrong with saying that? What's wrong with saying, you know what? This is what's going on, and Jesus is the answer. I wholeheartedly believe that God is going to begin to send into this church people who are struggling with their gender identity, people who are struggling with sexual identity, and people who are struggling with homosexual lifestyles. And I believe that God is going to send them in here because we're going to love them, we're going to accept where they are, and we're going to speak truth to them and then Jesus is going to deliver them and set them free. And they're going to walk in what they were called to walk in and be who they were called to be. Because God has a purpose and a plan for their life in these end days. And that, that's why all this is coming out of the woodwork. Because the devil knows that his time is almost up. And he's pulling everything that he possibly can. Every attack that he possibly can to try to cr confuse God's people. When you don't know if you're a boy or a girl, how can you live in peace and harmony? You can't. But when you know who you are in Christ Jesus, and you know that you were created in his image, and you know that he loved you before he created you, it gives you purpose it gives you identity. It gives you destiny. And the enemy does not want you to have that. So if you're watching this video today, if you're watching this video today or if you're watching this video on tape delay, and you have a friend that is struggling with, with their gender identity, if you have a friend who is struggling with their sexual identity, and maybe they're a kid, maybe they're a teenager, and their parent has embraced them, let them know that there's a place that they can come and get delivered and set free. Amen. We have a call. Can, can, can you tell I'm a little bit upset? As a father, whenever I've seen one of our kids struggle, and as a mother, whenever she's seen one of our kids struggle with something, no matter what, this, what, no matter what the attack was, fear, anxiety, depression, whatever, we recognized it, we spoke to it, we commanded it in the name of Jesus, to leave, we coached our children in the word of God, and we loved them, and we prayed for them, and we stood in the gap for them. We have to do the same for those struggling with, with gender identity. Because I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it is an attack from the pits of hell. And it may be a strong spirit, but it will melt like wax in a furnace when it's confronted with the authority of Jesus Christ. It has no choice to melt like wax in the presence and the authority of Jesus. So let's stand up and be that church 
who will speak the truth and love with the love of Jesus and teach with the love of Jesus because deliverance is a thing of beauty. It's a thing of beauty. When you see someone who was this way and then they met Jesus and they become this way, you're like, glory to God, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing. He is good. And he does not want to see his sons and daughters walk in captivity. And he's never, ever, ever going to trust and become affectionate with the spirit that is coming against one of his children. Nor should we. Amen? Bow your heads with me, please. I want our prayer team to come on down and get yourself situated as we get ready to pray here in a few minutes. I want to say this again, not just for the people that are here, but for those who may be listening on the live stream or listening when you watch this on a tape delay. I and this church will never battle against flesh and blood. That is not our battle. And we don't care where you are, where you've been, and what you're doing. We will and do love you. Our battle is always going to be against principalities, spiritual wickedness, rulers of darkness, that Ephesians 6.12 tells us that we're battling against. It's always going to be our battle. So we do not condemn you. We condemn the spirit. And we call that spirit out. And it doesn't even have to be a spirit of transgender or homosexuality or you know, whatever, any type of spirit that has you bound, you can get set free. In the name of Jesus. I'm closing this out in a word of prayer. And as always, as soon as I finish praying, these altars are going to be open. Because we believe in the power of prayer. And we believe in ministering to people. In and through the power of Jesus. So as I close us out in a word of prayer, as soon as I finish this prayer, if you want prayer for anything, these altars are open. If you're not coming down to the altars for prayer, I ask that you quietly and reverently make your way out into the foyer. Father, in the name of Jesus, may your Holy Spirit continue to move upon the hearts of your people right now. May you just begin to move upon us right now. In the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for a boldness. To be who you've called us to be. To walk in the authority that you've given us. Lord, we know that we're living in the last days and time is almost up. May we have an urgency within us
Father, I pray for a hedge of protection around your people as we leave here today. That you would be with us in our coming and our going. That you would fill us up with your Holy Spirit overflowing that wherever we go that we can minister the gospel of Jesus. That we can speak the truth in love. Lord, may we be the bride that you have called us to be. Lord, we ask that you would send into your house anyone who's struggling with gender identity, sexual identity, anyone who's struggling with any type of addiction struggling with any kind of trauma any type of emotional situations so that you can encounter them and we can love on them and you can set them free and they can walk in their true identity of who you created them to be Not walk in depression, but walk in the fullness of joy. Not walk in confusion, but walk in clarity of thought of who you created them to be and the calling that you have on their life. Father, I ask that you would just go with each one of us as we go our separate ways today. Protect us throughout the week. Be glorified in all that we do and we say. In Jesus' name, amen.